This video contains content sponsored by John Wilson Blades and MK Blades. Opinions discussed in this video do not reflect the views of John Wilson or MK. Well, hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees and I'm thrilled to welcome Coach Tom Zakrajek. Tom, I just read your book. Why don't you show the book to everyone and tell us about it? Okay, here's my book. All right, so those it's Good. Basic Training 101. It could be called Skating 101. Basically, for coaches, periodization principles for figure skating, an easy-to-use workbook. Tom, walk us through your inspiration, how this all came to be. Well, um, several years ago, I did a, a presentation at the PSA conference in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the middle of the presentation, everybody was taking out their phones and taking pictures of my slides. Mm -hmm. And certainly periodization has been like a hot topic for many years. It's kind of something in figure skating that figure skating coaches don't do a lot of compared to all the other Olympic coaches. Um, and certain sports lend itself more towards periodization and applying those principles easier maybe than figure skating. Um, but anyways, after that presentation, you know, people would casually come up to me and say, oh, can I get a copy of your presentation? Or, you know, you should really write a book about this. And that was the genesis of the idea. Obviously, very naively, I thought, well, gosh, this is going to be simple. I'll just use this presentation as a template and start from there but two and a half years later it was just more than I thought and then of course when you actually get into the nitty-gritty of taking this information and making sure that when someone reads it they understand it without you speaking about it that's kind of a whole different um, adds a whole different dimension to it so um, that was how the idea came out and what did you think of the book? Could you well, understand it? Was yes, it I could understand it. I understand a lot of it. There were some things I have questions about this whole 1 to 20 thing that we'll get into but okay. in terms of the exertion. But what I wanted to know is what inspired this? Were you an athlete who trained with periodization or are you someone who wished that you had these techniques to apply when you were a skater? I think it's the latter. Uh, okay. Of course, in the in the era that I started skating, which was like 1975. Um, in fact, I was just talking to Mitch Moyer from U.S. Figure Skating, not about periodization, but about boot development. And my Rydell skates that I had, my first pair of customs, you know, the leather was like that thin. There was absolutely no support in the boot back then, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of is an example of how the sport has changed because I remember being a young boy and basically my coaches and I had some very fine coaches base basically just teaching me a lesson like if they saw me and they went oh we need to fix that right so it wasn't really planned ever in my younger career I don't think and then certainly when I moved to Colorado uh, to Denver to work with Norma Celine um, and for the audience who doesn't know Norma, she was Charlie Tickner's coach and she coached Jill Trenery and many other top skaters. Um, she was the one that really had kind of an organization to training, but definitely not like things that I learned about when I actually studied sport. And when I knew I wanted to be a coach and I went back to get my master's degree, this was something that I was exposed to. And I went, wow, boy, this is really different from my orientation to sport and so that was kind of the genesis and ever since I started coaching um, you know you you read about Alexi Mishin and some of the other coaches from Europe who are very schooled in being a coach right and it's academic based and they go to the university and they learn about physical education and biomechanics and all those different things that maybe most US coaches don't go to school for um, so like when I knew that I was like, wow, if I ever want to compete with those coaches someday, I better do what they're doing. And so, um, ever since I started coaching way back in St. Joe, Missouri, within about two years, I started using these ideas. Well, I guess, what do you think the biggest mistakes coaches make with periodization is and then what do you think you know when did you first realize that your periodization was paying off and really see it in the results 
Um, probably six or seven years into my coaching, believe it or not, when I first started trying to write training plans and understanding tapering and, um, you know, trying to get kids to peak at certain competitions, taking the theory and then putting it into actually a person's body and mind is, you know, it's kind of an abstract principle and it took me several years to figure that out. So I would say probably around 1997, 98, and that kind of coincides with um, my uh, success as a coach getting skaters to the U.S. championships that I had raised from the beginning levels mm -hmm. and then getting them to be on the podium there uh, while I was coaching in St. Joe, Missouri, and then like right after I moved to the Broadmoor. Um, so that's when I would say kind of I really started to figure it out and then certainly there's always more milestones and then as the skaters go from level to level things change right because how you teach a developmental skater and what you emphasize at certain points of the year you know for someone that is a pre-juve or a juve or an intermediate is very different for from the work that I'm doing with say Tessa Hong or uh, Mariah Nagasu or Max Aaron um, and so way back then when that started to happen, I had more to figure out, right? Because I couldn't, and my first podium skater was Ryan Bradley. He was the first skater um, that I had coached at an international event. When he qualified for Junior Worlds, his year extended very differently. And like that was all new. So um, Ryan, if you're listening out there, you were kind of the guinea pig. And we joke about that a little bit because in fact it was true. Um, but obviously all the experiences I've had has helped have helped me kind of refine those t early templates that I created most of them were on just notebook paper and they were done with a pencil now certainly I do things sometimes on the computer it's easier to edit it's easier to rework um, things and it's also easier to have a template and then if I'm working with different skaters change things around without having to hand write everything out for every different skater now, one of the things you said is that one of the big mistakes that skaters make and that coaches make is that they taper too early. So to kind of discuss this, because regionals are coming up, the Grand Prix, I like to watch practice sessions. Mm -hmm. There are skaters who don't do their programs at events. There are skaters who do. What is the ideal Tom Z training like at a competition, the days leading up to it, etc.? Okay, so that's a really good question, and I would say, um, in general, that has been pretty consistent with all the skaters that I've had in the Grand Prix. Um, I would say maybe Jeremy Abbott was a little bit of an exception when he was in the Grand Prix. His taper was different, and it was really unique to his orientation to the sport. Um, and uh, so, basically, there's a lot of intense work up until two or three days prior to the actual competition and the idea of taking your especially if you have to go to a place where you will be jet lagged and converting your circadian rhythm to where you're going to actually be traveling to that can all be done prior to getting on a plane um, so to me that's a key point for if you're an international competitor um, it also can be important too if um, you are jet lagged even by two hours let's say uh, when you travel to sectionals and there's a time zone change you know sometimes people think oh you're only jet lagged if you cross the ocean and that's not necessarily true anytime your sleep schedule changes you get jet lagged your body will feel some effects and um, so that's probably the biggest thing, being able to get the body to function um, at a consistent level once the skater gets to the competition. And in the Senior Grand Prix, most of the time, unless you draw Skate America and Skate Canada and you train in North America, you're dealing with some type of jet lag wherever you go, right? And the trips to Moscow and Japan and China are very difficult on the body, right? And sometimes when the skater can't get there and feel normal, it does affect their ability to practice there, which sometimes affects their confidence. When they're jet lagged, they tend to want to do a lot less than what their body's normally uh, conditioned to do. And actually, 
keeping that conditioning and that activity the same is one of the keys to performing well when you travel overseas. Interesting. Now, one of the things that I read in your book, and I remember reading in Bella Caroli's book where he talked about the training plan the week of his gymnast. And you have Monday and Wednesday as the really tough days for peaking on Friday and Saturday. Now, yeah. just for even when I learned to skate as an adult, when I was actually skating five days in a row, I always really struggled on Monday. Monday was just getting the rust off. Now, you have that as your hard day. So I wonder why is that the hard day compared to Tuesday? And what's the Monday's day? the hard day because you just, uh, at least my athletes, come off of a day of rest. Mm -hmm. So Saturday tends to be a light to medium day. Mm -hmm. And then, so Saturday is actually can be kind of the beginning of a rest. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday is a total day off. And so the body is rested and able to hit hard right away. Now, is session one, are your skaters able to hit hard? Do they take to that second session on Monday, or how does that? Actually, it depends a lot on their lesson schedule. And I try to do my lesson schedule to know who I can work with and hit hard right away early in the day. So if the athlete generally wants to have the first one or two sessions to kind of get their legs underneath them. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, that would be more like Mirai. Mm -hmm. She will have her hard session on either her second or her third one. Max loves to hit it hard on the first session. Uh, mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you have to know your athletes. That's the other thing I mentioned in, in the book when, you, when you're applying this information. There are general principles that apply to all your skaters as a coach that you're working with. But then there's going to have to be variation and you will only know what that variation is once you know your athlete really well and that involves a lot of conversations and a lot of dialogue. One of the things is you're also a big proponent of water. You, have, you want people to drink a bottle of water per session, mm -hmm. which I mm -hmm. thought was interesting, especially because you're at altitude, which yes. is extra important. So. How much are we drinking? When are we going to the bathroom? What is happening on the ice at the World Arena? How does this all work ideally? I think you see a lot of skaters sip on water. I mean, if you watch Max Aaron at a competition on a practice session, we he does the fly-by water bottle grab okay. where he doesn't like to stop and stand around, so he grabs the water bottle, swigs on it, and even as he's moving, places it back on the barrier or hands it off to me. That hydration is critical. Obviously, H2O, so important for the muscles to function properly, right? And then so important when you're hydrated, your brain is going to fun function better too. So that improves your ability to focus and actually do what you've been trained to do. What about water on the airplane? Because there's a coach for gymnastics at the University of Oklahoma, KJ Kindler, who makes her athletes drink 80 ounces of water by the, from when they take off to when they land. Do you have a theory on that as well? Are you... I mean, I think that's good advice. And mm -hmm. most of the kids that travel with Team USA, um, mm -hmm. they get a jet lag protocol um, okay. from Peter Zappolo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've read those over and they mm -hmm. uh, encourage a lot of water consumption. I mean, it's really smart. Mm -hmm. um, it seems obvious. But actually, I think the point uh, that the coach is making is that you actually have to make your athletes sometimes do that because they might not feel like drinking. They may feel bloated after a certain amount of water. But, um, you know, I think the kids pretty much that I coach, they know what they're supposed to do and they're getting it done. So let's talk about some other things. I thought was interesting as you talked about lactic acid. And you said that most people think that lactic acid is when they're really at the exertion level, but that that's not, and that you could develop muscle power from that. So when do you know when to back off and how much lactic acid and kind of walk me through that? Okay, so in figure skating, when kids, uh, skaters train daily, mm -hmm. they're going to feel like their legs are tired. They're going to feel like their legs are burning. Mm -hmm. And I think the book mentions this and cites several studies. Um, in fact, I did my master's thesis on lact the lactate shuttle hypothesis, okay. which is something de developed by a man uh, by the name of George Brooks, mm -hmm. who basically said, you know, lactic acid isn't a dead end metabolite that ends up in your muscles after you exercise. Mm -hmm. It actually, through some metabolic processes, serves as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. And I think the best example to illustrate that point. Uh, and I talk to my athletes about this a lot. And uh, I'm actually talking to a young junior man that I coach, Camden Pulkinen, about this right now because he's 
um, really doing well and he's getting stronger and better because he's learning about how to train and how to train when you're fatigued or when you feel per uh, fatigue or you perceive that you're fatigued like those are all kind of interrelated so I'm talking to him about you know Michael Phelps and the other swimmers right after they did those races in Rio what did they do they would maybe do a short interview with NBC and then they'd excuse themselves to go into the lap pool and they would swim after they exerted their body to flush the lactate uh, and get the Krebs cycle going so they could recover, right? That seems kind of contrary to what most people think of doing when they're tired. They think, oh my gosh, I've got to sit down and rest, right? Mm -hmm. That's how my body's going to repair itself and not necessarily actual light activity or um, activity like swimming done at a, a maybe a much slower pace and a casual pace is very effective for recovery and getting that um, lactate out of the system. Same thing with figure skating. You don't necessarily have to just sit in the lobby on a bench in between a session to get your body ready for the next session and have it recover, right? So there's light activity you can do off the ice. There's even light skating that you can do at the end of the session that cools your body down, especially if you have back-to-back -back sessions with maybe one ice make in between. So there are a lot of strategies to use to maximize your ability to train. Um, but I think that's a critical one. I, I don't know about other coaches around the country, but certainly for, for my athletes, no matter what level they're at, that is something that they have to be educated about. And then, I mean, we may call that something as common as, you know, pushing past your limit or, you know, you know, hitting the wall and working through the wall, you know, breaking through that wall. That's kind of layman's terms to describe a complex physiological process that goes on in the body. Hmm. But it is doable. Now and if you're wondering how all the if you're wondering how all those top skaters back end load their programs, yeah, right. If you're back end loading a lot of jump content like Yuzuru and Yevgenia, the way they do that, they are really working that system, right? They have to be. There's no other way to train the body to tolerate that. So your athletes do laps after their programs, and you wrote about this. And I wanted to know. When do you do they do then corrections of mistakes right after of jump repetition? Say if they missed it in the program, when do you do that? And how do you feel about jump about double run throughs? Are they beneficial or are they not as beneficial? Yes, to all of that. Okay, okay. so let's talk about laps first. The, yes, laps in general, but then there's also those laps will be varied as that section talks about. You have to be able to mix it up. Sometimes they do it with those power shoots mm -hmm. uh, that you saw when you and Jenny were there last summer. Mm -hmm. Some di sometimes they do the laps clockwise. Sometimes they just do one lap. It depends on where they are in their training cycle. So that's something that, though the concept is standard, there has to be variation with how it's implemented. And certainly the laps they do in the summer versus the laps they do the week before they leave for their Grand Prix are not the same, right? Yeah. That seems obvious. Then the other thing you just mentioned was the double run throughs. Oh, also double. mistakes. So when oh, do you so correct mistakes. the mistakes? Yeah. So same thing because early in the season when they're learning their programs and beginning to train their programs, it's not smart when they're really super duper fatigued to have them redo their errors because that could cause an injury, right? So there had that that application of that has to be at the right moment. So they have to have a baseline level of conditioning and then you're asking them to push through and develop some strength redoing the elements they missed while they're fatigued, right? So again, it's all about the timing. And then the part about double run-throughs, absolutely. Um, in Colorado Springs, sometimes they go back to back. Max has a history of having done that, not maybe within the last two years, but maybe within the last four years. Um, sometimes he would do back-to-back run-throughs. Um, I will tell you, Mirai um, has been doing a lot of that this season, back-to-back run-throughs. She has been training so hard and making her heart and her lungs so strong so that, you know, that last half of the program looks easy and, and projects itself as, you know, high quality. So, you know, it just depends, you know, is Max doing double run-throughs now? No, he doesn't really have to, though. He is in impeccable shape for other reasons. And then that's the other part of training in Colorado Springs. There is a high-altitude training advantage that skaters feel when they return to sea level. And, um, 
you know, that's just one of the benefits of, of what happens to figure skaters that train here. So let's th- talk about, you mentioned Max, you mentioned Mirai and Tessa. You obviously have your training plans of which you said there are five big macro cycles that we, you need mm-hmm. four months to get ready for the competition. And you talked about, I want to know what is the plan for them? Obviously you're looking at performance of what you hope they do on the ice. So with Max, I know that he's trying to put in the quad toe. Is the quad toe in the plan for nationals? And kind of walk us through what the plan is and at what point does he need to start hitting that and which cycle if he wants to do it later on in this season? Yeah, so we did a lot of training of the quad toe this summer and he actually performed it in the short program with the sow at Champs Camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously not a lot of people saw that because Champs Camp wasn't open to the public. Um, and then it was on the docket for Lombardia uh, with not a lot of success in the program, in the free skate, but definitely some success on the practice. So um, not surprising that it's now on the back burner mm-hmm. till probably, uh, my guess is after China, that's mm-hmm. when we're going to bring it out again. But in the meantime, he's, and I don't know if you've been following um, Instagram, he's been working on the quad axle. I and the saw quad that on the axle. harness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we're pretty confident, especially after watching Nathan compete in Finlandia, that it's not really going to be, um, you know, just a one quad program with high GOE and great components that really, you know, makes an American man stand out on the world podium. It's going to be a multiple quad program. Um, and, and we're going to do some observing uh, through the Grand Prix and see exactly who's doing what. But I think certainly we have benefited from Nathan Chen training uh, at the World Arena, even as he recovered from his injury. And we knew that he was doing Lutz and Flip really as early as June, uh, late May and June. So to see him accomplish that, um, you know, in Finland was was quite amazing. And we only anticipate that he's going to get stronger, right? He has got a tremendous work ethic, and um, I think that's obvious. So, um, you know, Max is able to do the toe. He's actually able to do the quad loop, too. He did it when he was invited to the Stars on Ice tour. I think anybody who was in that tour and saw him practice, um, you know, with that gang of skaters, whoever that was right after the Olympics saw him do quad loops there. So he's capable of a lot more than he's shown. But quite frankly, the emphasis heading into the Grand Prix is on um, the spin levels, not just being four, but the GOE getting to a plus two and then his performance aspects. So um, that is still an area that is top priority. And we feel confident because Max has experience with the quad toe even in 2013 and 14 that interjecting that one jump isn't going to be or two jumps isn't going to be that difficult for him provided that everything else has been raised to a level that's podium standard. Let's talk about Max's quads for a bit. Last year you were always on him committing to the quad sow triple toe combination Mm -hmm. for commitment day. That was his big thing that he had to do it because he would always do quad double. Yes. How is that going in his training? And why is the quad sow easier than the quad toe for Max? Is it just the takeoff that he likes? Or? Um, I think just technique. I think when Max was a young boy, from what I understand, um, he didn't necessarily um, commit to figure skating at a very young age. And so he was always skating and doing hockey, but kind of self-taught. Um, you know, maybe his sisters got more attention. And so he was you know, maybe short on lessons and maybe a little bit short on dedication while he was a hockey player and he was kind of just dabbling in figure skating. So he did a lot of self-teaching, which creates some difference in technique, especially for picking, right, for picking on that toe. And the sow doesn't have that, right? So he's able to manage that takeoff just a little better, right? Um, And so I think that's probably the biggest the biggest thing for Max and yes he quad triple is still a huge part of the commitment day for Max and I think last season was a big turning point for him he's certainly doing quad triples in practice 
Um, but I think he, he has a lot more confidence after his success last year mm -hmm. at so many competitions performing so consistently and doing the quad triple so consistently. So um, it's maybe a tad bit less of an emphasis right now. Well, I read your bio in this book and it says that you've taught more triple axles and quads to different men than any other coach. How did you count that? What is the number? Are, how close are you in Alexei Mishin? I want to know how you determine this. Yeah. Uh, probably just through observation. Okay. So, and just through, like, you could go to my website mm -hmm. in my detailed bio and it'll list all the skaters that I've taught those jumps to mm -hmm. and all of, um, like whether it was an axle or a quad and all the quads that I taught them. Okay. And um, I think just looking around the world, it's kind of easy to figure out. And you're right, Mishin may have a claim to that, but... I don't know if he has a claim. I think you two would be the ones that I would think of it would come to mind. Yeah, so Who with no disrespect quad? to him, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. Who was your first quad? Uh, first quad... Ooh, I think it was Ryan Bradley, quad mm -hmm. toe. He learned the quad toe and did it at Skate Canada before he ever did his triple axel, actually. Okay. You'd have to go back uh, many, many years. Mm -hmm. So I think he was the first quad. Now, do you think that the in, in past, you know, the toe and the sow have gone back on the point values? Which do you think is easier, the toe or the sow? Well, I think, again, that depends on the skater, yeah. right? I think mo in general, you see a lot of quad toes mm -hmm. because in general, I think most skaters would feel that the toe assist helps them vault into the air and have the air time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're starting to see more quad sow cows. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, look, you're starting, like the only quad left is the quad axle, right? Because the loop's been done now, the flip and the lutz. And I think just like there was an explosion of, men doing triple axles um, a few years after Vern Taylor did it, you're going to see that same thing now with the quad loop flip and lutz. The young men coming up around the world are going to be looking at these top men going, oh, I guess that must not be hard since so many of them right, have done it. right." And Brandon Moreau's did it for the first time, I think, in what, 2012? Is it he had the yeah. black costume on. He did it in Asia. Yes. Uh, and yeah, he did so it at the Colorado competition first because the Guinness came, yeah? Yeah, yeah. so 2012. 2011, I want to say. And so now, four, less than four years later, we had Bo Young doing it, and now Nathan, and I know Vincent can do it. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of quad lutzes that are popping up, well, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, You're also really known for your axle technique. If you think about some of the great triple axles, Jeremy's, Joshua Ferris, you're responsible for both of them. So what is kind of your theory of the axle technique? You talked about in one of your notes kind of stepping from the back outside edge to the forward outside edge. And a lot of skaters, I'm someone I don't like the feeling of jumping forwards. I got the double sow much easier. You really did read this book and take good notes. I did, Tom Z. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for bringing that up yeah. because the other part, and, and that was the section where I really talk about the double axle because I knew when I wrote this book mm -hmm. that most coaches, um, you know, coach developing skaters, I still do, mm -hmm. and the biggest transition for a young skater is to go from the double lutz to the double axle. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of exercises and a lot of time in this book talking about that jump in particular and how to train it to learn it for that reason. But you're right, the same thing applies to the triple axle. Um, I will say that is the key to focus on. I don't want to necessarily talk in detail about the technique because obviously... Trade secrets, yes. Yes, <laughs> but that transition is critical because if there's any part of that um, that swings around, it, it doesn't matter how strong you are, you're not going to be able to collect yourself quickly enough even if you have the height to be able to complete those revolutions. So whether it's two and a half or three and a half, it's, it's, it's the most important uh, part of it. The other thing I'll say in my very first lesson, every time I work with a, a male skater on this jump, and that includes Camden Polkinen, who I just taught it to several months ago, the very first words I give to a male skater are step strong. So how's that for a tip, right? That, that step a good tip. has to be yes. strong. <laughs> Well, I also, you talk a lot about um, 
you, in some of the plans for the juvenile skater, you talked a lot about the body position you want in the air, how you want the head not to move, and you said elbows down. Now, I remember looking... Mishin at one point sold a vest where he wanted the arms and the and it showed like where he wanted his hands. I know Frank likes them to the right, hugged in like this. You say elbows down. Do you have a preference on where the hands are? Uh, so, okay, so elbows down can apply to Mishin's technique, Frank's mm -hmm. technique. My preference mm -hmm. of symmetry uh, in the air, and I think I have a, a picture of Tessa Hong mid-flight. I don't know if you recognized her or not in that I'll, actual picture. I'll have to go back and look. Okay. Yes. I mean, obviously, that picture was, um, it's a screenshot of a video. Okay. And, um, but basically, that is the desirable position. And whether or not there's variation on that position, which if you look at a lot of my skaters, there can be variation on that position, has to do with their body shape, their body height, their body size, their weight whether they're male or female, and kind of where they are in the developmental scale. Um, I put that also in the book because my experience has been an improper use of arms when skaters are training jumps contributes to a ton of issues, right? Once skaters know the basic concept of how to jump, then their arms can get in the way a lot. And so they, if they don't know what they're doing with them and exactly where they should be, um, that's something that can really help a coach help a skater uh, anytime they're learning a jump. And, you know, developmentally young children just don't have all of that coordination, even if they're talented and have a, a good basic athletic, um, what I would call body and intuition, they still have to learn the specific coordination for figure skating skills. So that's why I chose to highlight that aspect in that particular uh, thing because it's it's kind of a clue to all the young coaches who may be starting out going well what do I emphasize because that's the other thing I wanted to do with this book you know when you teach a lesson you could teach a great lesson to a skater um, and impart your knowledge and a lot of coaches have a lot of knowledge but the book is really about teaching them what to do when right instead of just maybe what they see that day, they have to have a vision and a bigger, longer term picture for development. Mm -hmm. Now, you were on the Junior Grand Prix, obviously with Tessa, we see a lot of skaters with a lot of triple triples. Sometimes they lose them, jumps to puberty. Is that the arm technique a lot that you talk about? I guess, what is the big contributing factor, that technique that lasts and technique that doesn't? Yes, well, I would say arms are important. I don't want to say that I just coach jumps by using arms, mm -hmm. but basically once the skater knows how to skate mm -hmm. and they know how to use their loading of their knee and ankles, right, and they're really comfortable with their toe picks and the ability to rock, right, and shift their weight um, and lean, once they know that and then they know the rhythm, mm -hmm. It's all about that moment of takeoff and taking the body from a somewhat extended position and tightening it. Okay. So when puberty happens, it's really not about body changes per se. It's really about them being able to pay attention to what they've learned, hopefully. And so that's the other tip. When you mentioned Jeremy Abbott and Josh Ferris, another tip on triple axles is get it in the muscles as young as possible right mm -hmm. and I'm not the pioneer of that I've certainly followed the lead of Alexei Mishin and a lot of other great coaches in Japan and Russia and even in Canada um, who have really taught triple axles to a lot of men when they're young I mean even Elisabetta we know had a triple axel uh, when she was a younger girl mm -hmm. so it's a lot easier for the body to learn things when the body is young, if it falls, if it makes mistakes, it's less likely to get an injury. You get to that. The skater's less likely to get hurt, um, and basically, it's they the repetitions can be tolerated more, and then the falls are less painful, right? So there's nothing worse than being a grown man and falling on a quadruple jump, right? Yeah. It's not fun. Well, I haven't. <laughs> no I'm imagining. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Well. You say about, you know, you want to get the triple axel young. Now, in real life terms, Mariah is very young. But in skating terms, she's obviously a veteran at this point. This is her third cycle that she's gone through. How much did she have the triple axel in her? I know we saw videos of her doing it. It wasn't around as a kid. But 
where was she? Obviously, she's been focusing on this. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think for Mariah, it was just about a technique change, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't want to. Mariah has a great double axle, right? Yeah. And she has a big double axle. She always has. So it wasn't about her double axle not being uh, high or strong or fast or big or on axis. But there were some alignment issues that we had to work through. Mm -hmm. um, and those alignment issues were so related to timing. Mm -hmm. And it took a, a little less than two years, um, but about two full years of her working on it, but a little less for her to have that actually click, mm -hmm. right? Because when the body's used to doing something for a certain amount of time, to change it is not easy. And obviously, you know, you when you were here, you saw Mariah. I didn't have to ask Mariah to work on triple yeah. axles, right? It's she coming wants from, it, yeah. Yes, it's coming from her. And the other thing is she actually has um, a very, very athletic, graceful body. So she is gifted with a body that can tolerate a triple axle, and she can tolerate falling. And um, she has a mindset and a desire. There's so many things that you know, it's just, I feel so fortunate to be working with her because there's a lot I don't have to teach her, right? Mm -hmm. Part of that comes from her and the other part of it comes from the great coaches that have previously coached her. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really the right time for it to click. And um, since the video that went viral several weeks ago, she's done a lot more. I know a few weeks prior to Mariah landing that triple axle when she was so, so close, Christy Kral skated up to me and she goes, you know, Tom, she's going to get that. I said, I know it's just a matter of time. So that was really exciting to have that kind of support from Christy too. And just everybody in the rink has been really, you know, applauding her, even parents that sit and watch in the stands. They know that that is a jump that just a handful of women in the world can do, right? It's not even everybody who wants to do it. It's just a handful that actually that have that desire that will be able to do it. So it really, like I said, it was really about alignment and timing. Mm -hmm. Well, last year we saw her do the triple axel. Now in your book, you said that you don't want to put it in until a certain percentage, but I know that it was a tactical move. There were also points at stake. Yes. So you took a calculated risk last year. Will we see- And it was a mistake, right? That was a big mistake and I'll own that. And I own that with Mariah and Nebelhorn really um, on the plane trip home. Mm -hmm. uh, it cost her a medal there. Um, she had done it in the jump event mm -hmm. um, that June. She had also done it in the short program at the Broadmoor Open. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were trying it in the short program and she had been training it. But basically what I think Mariah was doing was trying the triple axel for me. Mm -hmm. instead of really doing it because she wanted to do it. Because our strategy was that even if it was a one carat, like she could land on one foot and she could train that. In fact, she was training triple axel, uh, two triple axles in the long back to back. Oh, wow. One in a combo, and one in plane. Mm -hmm. She didn't really feel ultimately confident about it because she knew it was a carat going into it, right? Mm -hmm. It's different when you have a clean jump and maybe that specific twitch on the takeoff just doesn't turn out right and then you get a carrot but she knew that it wasn't totally clean and once we worked that out I realized that we just had to do more work in order for her to risk it how fixable are the carrots with certain skaters when you see oh they're that? all fixable all of okay. that's fixable and I think um, some of it is developmental uh, I think there's a lot of um, you know, uh, the other thing I like to tell coaches when they ask me questions about mm -hmm. training and my background, which, you know, I had an intense desire to study. It's part of my personality. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sit in the classroom. I wanted to learn. I also had time in the early part of my career in order to do that. But not every figure skating coach can do that. So I always remind them that every figure skating coach is a biomechanist. Mm -hmm. They are observing athletes moving their body every day, right? Constantly, all day long, as much as they teach. And so it's just a matter of being purposefully observant, taking notes, talking to your athlete, um, depend on certain things. But, you know, if you're just trying to figure things out, you just have to 
just have a good eye and watch over and over again. You know, when I was a young coach, even before I was in school, I watched videos. Mm -hmm. um, that came from an early coach of mine, Dick Rimmer. Um, he coached, um, I, I believe, Julie Holmes in the 1972 Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and he had me sit down and watch videos when I was a little boy and we'd study techniques. It was a lot of fun. I remember that being an important part of my learning, mm -hmm. right? Jumping and understanding jumping, watching Tyler Cranston, John Curry, Jan Hoffman, Robin Cousins, Charlie Tickner, all those, uh, David Santee, Scott Hamilton. We watched all of those skaters and Denise Bielman, I might add, because she was doing triples way back when before any women were doing triples, right? I mean, Linda Fradiani was, but Denise Bielman was doing the flip and the Lutz and uh, almost the loop and trying to do triple toe as a second jump way back in 1980. So she was really a pioneer. So you just study those videos and you start to learn techniques. And that's what I recommend also to young coaches, you know, do a lot of video work. And, and now it's so much easier with videos on YouTube and apps and things. You can slow things down easier and, you know, just, you know, make yourself your own best scientist. Well, you have a couple of competitions going up. So as we wrap up, I want to ask what to look for. Last year, I knew to look for Max with the quad sow triple toe. What should we be looking for him on the Grand Prix? What do you want to see from him? Okay, for Max, you want to see level four spins with the plus two GOE. And you want to see him really emotionally connected to his short and his long program music, right? The yeah. short is Pavarotti, the long is the Lion King. You should see him able to express that music with his body. Mm -hmm. um, and also his face. That's a huge thing we're working on. Okay. As well as the quad triple. Is this still? Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. If he does a quad double, he'll hear about it from me. Okay. <laughs> How about Mariah Nagasu? What are we looking for in the training plan for the next couple of weeks in competition? Uh, for Mariah, I mean, I don't really want to jinx her. I mm -hmm. just want to say that at Nationals, mm -hmm. I um, tweeted right after she made the podium again. Mm -hmm that this was going to be her year and I fully believe that. Mm -hmm. She has tr been training so well and I think you know you could just ask any of the skaters in the rink that are watching her. This is a different Mariah and I think what we want to look for is that Mariah feels the confidence mm -hmm. to show that she could be one of the best women, one of the top women not just in our country again but in the world right you get her to I, smile in those programs yes and also you know the other thing uh look for her to take her time and embellish each artistic movement that um jeff has given her and david has given her we've been working a lot with video working a lot with timing working a lot with her taking her time and letting the movement breathe so that the technical things that she's doing just come out of an entire program and it doesn't look like she's just skating a clean program. It is a, a total performance. Well, last year we didn't get to see Tessa Hong due to an injury. We right. saw her in the Junior Grand Prix. She had some success in the short program. What are you looking for her to do in the coming so, weeks? So, I don't know if you remember but um, or if you even know, but um, after the Broadmoor Open, Tessa was very impressive there. Mm -hmm. And then she had a a minor injury mm -hmm. and so she didn't get to train the whole summer mm -hmm. and so what you should look for um, with Tessa at sectionals is to be a whole lot stronger I mean I think the Broadmoor Open showed everybody who follows figure skating and who was tuning in early because she beat so many of the top US women there that competed mm -hmm. anyway and she wasn't e even in peak shape that she can be a real contender right mm -hmm. she just she's just using the time now since her opportunity Opportunity in Estonia to get really back into her training, right? And uh, and then I think we all know what she's capable of when she's trained. And uh, how about your junior man? What was his name? And uh, what was you? Falkenen. And what is the goal for this year? With uh, I mean, obviously he was at nationals last year in junior. He learned a triple triple this year already in a triple axle. He's almost got a quad toe, so to be a competitive junior man nowadays I mean the stakes are really high right and and he has aspirations beyond just qualifying for the US championships um, but this is a kid who is very athletic very artistic he has incredible flow 
And he is just, I guess the way I would say it is happy-go-lucky. Mm-hmm. He is just one of those kind of skaters that enjoys learning, enjoys training. And he's, you know, he's such a great student that I expect to see, you know, if you, if you watch him at the summer competitions and then saw, saw him in Salt Lake, it was a big springboard. And then he did about the same that he did in Salt Lake in, the, uh, in his JGP in Estonia. Mm-hmm. But now the idea is to springboard even more and, um, you know, to be that kind of uh, top international competitor. He knows that he has to deliver clean programs, like with positive GOE on every element under the pressure of competition, right? And so he's just learning how to train that and then he's going to have to learn how to compete that. So that's what I would watch out for. I don't know about what he can do in terms of clean programs at sectionals that's going to be determined over the next four weeks as he gets more into his training Um, he'll be close if he's not clean for sure and then the idea is to really go to nationals and go bam 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 and hit it hard and and he'll have more time between sectionals and nationals to train and get stronger well sectionals weekend is my favorite weekend and i always like to look for the specific personalities and you definitely have one with Chase Belmontes. So what should <laughs> really? we... You don't say. <laughs> what should we be looking for for Chase Belmontes at okay. sectionals, Tom? Okay, I, I think if I had to pick a word, mm-hmm. it would be confident. Okay. He just has to be confident, right? Chase is fun. Everybody that follows figure skating really um, identifies him as sometimes just calling a spade a spade and putting out outrageous comments that make us laugh and they entertain us. But he's really improved. Philip Mills has given him two really fine programs this year. In fact, some of the buzz we've been hearing from the officials who know him have said, wow, you're really starting to learn how to skate. And then, of course, his quad toe is getting much more consistent. He's landed probably uh, close to 20 of them not in competition yet, but he's starting to hit them in training more and with the music. And then his triple axle is either rotating clean or landing a carrot on one foot. And so that skill's getting better. So I always tell Chase, sometimes when I'm coaching other skaters, I use his uh, videos to demonstrate some of my exercises to some of the kids that you know, he might perceive as being better than him. So he really has a lot of ability that he hasn't shown in competition probably since Boston Nationals. And so for him to just feel the confidence to know that he's capable and and that he can deliver the programs because he also is one that trains at a higher level than he will compete at. So we want him to feel confident in that competitive moment. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I recommend... Well, I can't leave out TJ Nyman. So yes, TJ Chase. Nyman. Yes. What are we looking from TJ? Uh, well, TJ also, he's another one that is just learning how to train at a higher level, right? He's um, His triple axle is hugely consistent since Salt Lake. And that was really his first competition since coming back from an injury that he had last season where he didn't even get to compete. So he's also going to look to throw down some close to clean programs or clean programs at his section. And um, I know his uh, short program to Michael Jackson has been re-choreographed by Drew Meekins. And I think the program and the music selection really suits him and it's even better now. And um, the funny thing is I've got so many skaters doing Jekyll and Hyde in the rink. He's got a long to Jekyll and Hyde. Chase has a long to Jekyll and Hyde. And Becky Pang has a long to Jekyll and Hyde. So we're a little bit Jekyll and Hyde out in our rink. But I think TJ's take on that program is um, really powerful. And if he can hit, um, improve his spins and hit his uh, his big tricks, he's going to really post some highly competitive scores that would make him like really um, considered for an international assignment this spring as a junior. Now, what section is he in? What section? He's in he? Easterns. He's in Easterns. Chase is in Pacific, right? Coast, and Camden's in Midwest, oh. with also Luke West, another skater that I coach. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, we've got them spread out. Any young hot shots for us to pay attention to as well? Um, well, the the picture that I posted, 
on Instagram. The Kerrigan Spiral, e- yes. E Beast Double Field. This is okay. a little girl who's seven. Um, she already does double loop, double loop. She does all the doubles. We're working on double axle on the floor. She is not in a qualifying position yet, mm-hmm. but certainly um, kind of with her ability and talent, maybe three to four years from now, she could really be giving the Japanese and Russian ladies a run for their money, right? Well, what is your MK moment of the Junior Grand Prix so far? What what impressed you the most, Tom? The Junior Grand Prix. Oh, it has to be the Korean boy, right? Yeah. In um See, Japan. I like Marin Honda, Tom. Okay. Uh, that is <laughs> <laughs> Know what blades he's in i don't know if it has to be an mk it skate. doesn't have to be yeah but. no because it was the korean boy and when i saw brian orser mm-hmm. um in montreal mm-hmm. uh, i congratulated him i mean not only did he skate in a moment where he needed to skate right against mm-hmm. vincent joe he just like threw it down mm-hmm. so you know and that's not easy to do mm-hmm. but um he won his first grand prix Free medal, right? Mm-hmm. And gold medal for Korea as a male skater. I mean, that's a huge, huge accomplishment and such a great thing for young Korean boys around the world and young Korean boys in his country and a great thing for figure skating, right? It just shows that you don't necessarily always have to come from a big major skating nation to, to be a success. So that would be probably my junior Grand Prix moment. All right. Well, we thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you throughout the season and everyone pick up Basic Training 101 by Tom Z. Tom, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dave. I so appreciate it. Yeah.